No, not that one. Gary Hudson. That's a name we won't stop hearing about. After blowing up Percheron, he and some others started Pacific American Launch Systems with the intent of building a fully reusable SSTO called Phoenix. But we'll get to that one eventually. In roughly 1987, Pacific American changed gears to develop the Liberty launch vehicle as an interim project. Liberty might refer to Hudson's libertarian politics, the old Liberty ship which helped with World War II, or it just sounds nice. Technically, Liberty II comes first, but I prefer to go in proper numeric order. Liberty I was a two-stage pressure-fed small sat launcher meant, according to Hudson, to build up team understanding and develop in-house procedures in launch vehicle development before working on a much larger vehicle. The images you see are the only ones that I know exist. Stage 1 would be a LOX kerosene pressure-fed engine with 245 kilonewtons of thrust, 270 seconds ISP in vacuum, and uh, well that's it. Stage 2 was a pressure-fed NTO MMH engine with 300-ish seconds ISP and 17.8 kilonewtons of thrust. The vehicle's payload capacity to LEO isn't listed, but I'm going to guess it's a one ton or less launcher. One site suggests 227 kilograms. Gross liftoff weight was 19.18 metric tons. That's it. Liberty One was going to be funded by DARPA for polar launches from Vandenberg. A prototype Stage One was built and engine testing was going to start when Orbital Sciences got the contract with Pegasus. The first Liberty II was a strange looking vehicle and unlike the rest. It was going to be a fully reusable two-stage system powered by spare F1 and J2 engines. NASA had seven F1s and ten J2s left over from the end of the Saturn program and Hudson wanted to use them for Liberty. This Liberty was designed, like the rest, to carry about 40,000 pounds, 18 metric tons to low Earth orbit, and inject 2 to 5 metric tons into geostationary transfer orbit. I can't find masses for this Liberty 2, so here's some F1 and J2 figures. F1 had a thrust of 1.5 million pounds, which is nearly 6,700 kilonewtons, and an ISP of 270 seconds in vacuum. J2 burned LOX hydrogen with 232,250 pounds, 1 meganewton of thrust, and an ISP of 421 seconds. These engines, of course, were the workhorses of the Apollo program. You know who else wanted to use these engines? Hughes and Boeing, which were working on their Jarvis launcher. Pacific American couldn't compete with them, so they redesigned the rocket. The first redesign is technically two, since there's two versions of this one floating around. Uh, this one, the flat-bottomed one, shows up in diagrams of the launch platform, and one of the two technical papers, well, this one, the conical bottom, appears in concept art. I'll, I'll use this one. You can see how the design was improved to be something like a big dumb booster. Both engines became pressure feds, and it appears the design philosophy changed towards an ultra-expendable system. Payload capacity to LEO dropped to 15,000 pounds, 6.8 metric tons, and 4 to 5,000 pounds, 1.8 to 2.7 metric tons to GTO. Stage 1 would be powered by an 850,000 pound, uh, 3.7 meganewton thrust engine with an average ISP of 260 seconds and chamber pressure of 250 psi. At liftoff, it would weigh 641,000 pounds, or 291 metric tons, and hold 450,000 pounds, or 204.1 metric tons of propellant. Stage 2 would have an engine with 90,000 pounds of thrust, or 400 kilonewtons, an ISP of 420 seconds, and have a chamber pressure of 120 psi. This stage would weigh 111,000 pounds, or 50.35 metric tons, at start and contain 100,000 pounds, 45.36 metric tons of propellant. The launch pad was going to be a simple low-cost system, shown here. It would be made of steel and water-cooled. Propellants, gases, power, and other necessary infrastructure would be loaded at the base of the vehicle, eliminating the need for a gantry. Payloads would be placed on the launcher with a special crane setup. Propellants themselves would be loaded from tanker trucks, simplifying the process. At first, Liberty would launch from Kennedy and Vandenberg, but the plan was to make a special equatorial launch site by 1991. Also included in the design were three payload fairings, short, long, and shuttle custom. Long was meant for direct competition with Ariane 4 payloads, 
and the shuttle custom was, you guessed it, meant to compete for shuttle-sized payloads. The Liberty II design changed again to this vehicle. Stage 1's single pressure-fed engine became 7, with 121.5 thousand pounds of thrust each, or 540.5 kilonewtons. Payload capacity surged to 25,000 pounds, or 11.34 metric tons, to LEO, and 7 to 8,000 pounds, or 3.175 to 3.629 metric tons to geostationary transfer orbit. Stage 2's pressure-fed LOX LH2 engine was replaced with six RL10A3B engines with 16.5 thousand pounds of thrust each, or 73.4 kilonewtons, and an ISP of 440 seconds. The glow of the stage increased to 141,000 pounds and 130,000 pounds of propellant. These versions of the RL10 were not built at the time, but closely resembled those flying on Atlas G, 1, and Titan IV Centaur stages. Liberty II intended to launch for $25 million in 1988 dollars, which is about $62 million today, with a high flight rate goal of 10 to 15 million, which is 24.8 to 37.2 million today. Some of this would be due to the high cost of six RL-10 engines, but Pac-Am was in talks with Pratt & Whitney to go with more mass production. And then there's Liberty X. You can't find much on it except vague references in commercial launch ideas for space station freedom and one or two science missions. Liberty X was an SSTO capable of putting 2,000 pounds, 907 kilograms, into LEO. It would have a max acceleration of 10 Gs in flight, and it would cost $5 million, or 12.4 million today, per launch if you bought three launches together. That's it. Funds ran out and Liberty never left the drawing board. Would any of the Liberties have worked? Liberty X? It's an SSTO, so my default answer is no. As an expendable SSTO? Eh. That's it. Liberty 1? Sure, a pressure-fed LOX kerosene first stage was previously developed by Hudson to some success. And pressure-fed NTO MMH engines are flying already. Plus, a small LV as a team-building exercise is a smart idea to ensuring your team knows how to communicate and solve technical problems. And it shows your company's seriousness without great financial risk. We'll be talking about this with Beale Aerospace. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. The fully reusable Liberty II? Debatable, but I'd say unlikely. The problem with using F1 and J2, again, was that these are outdated engines that lacked proper documentation during their own development. Pac-Am would have spent a lot of money getting them to work again on their own launcher. Reusing the first stage from a water landing was proven by Robert Truax as part of his Sea Dragon studies, and NASA did work on soaking H1 engines to test Saturn I first stage recovery in the 1960s. So that might have worked. Second stage? Dubious. The pressure-fed Liberty II is still a gray area, since the pressure feed system for the LOX hydrogen stages was listed as to be determined in both papers. Conceptually, it works. And the simplified launch pad infrastructure is actually currently used by Astra. Liberty II with the RL-10s is the most likely to have worked from a technical standpoint. Making smaller engines would have lowered development costs and headaches, and would theoretically save money through mass production. Ish. From the commercial standpoint, this one is hard to say. It would have been competing directly with Atlas, Delta II, and Ariane 4. And this is before the Russian launchers became popular. Unlike Conestoga or Amrock, the launch market for Liberty II existed in this period, so I'd say it's a question of if Pac-Am got the right amount of funding, a reasonable development time, and a practical launcher out of their plans. Pricing-wise, I'm shocked to see it's a reasonable number for today's launch market. This is a plausible system. Pacific American Launch Systems is often seen as the company behind the Phoenix SSTOs, but a lesser-known rocket was also proposed and started development under them. This vehicle started as an interesting, fully reusable rocket that evolved into a more conventional, pressure-fed expendable system. Plausible, but lost in the shuffle. Liberty! That's a rocket you know.